A man named Leonard Ravenhill has been a spiritual father to me right around the same time David Wilkerson was. And I'll never forget because I believe the words that Leonard Ravenhill would say. And he said this, maturity comes from obedience and not necessarily from age. What that means is I've seen many old, immature Christians and I've seen many young, mature Christians. But the determining factor has always been obedience to what God is speaking to people's lives. Obedience to the scriptures. And that's why I just tell you, one of, it's, it's so important to remember. One decision of obedience to the Lord, I'm telling you, is more powerful and produces more spiritual growth than sitting here listening to a thousand sermons. Folks, you can listen to a hundred sermons, a thousand sermons, but I'm telling you what produces the growth and the maturity is not listening, but it's obeying what the Lord wants. Because truth without obedience is simply hypocrisy. We can't just hear and not obey. And that's why I, don't think, I, I have to tell you, as I have prayed, as we're in a series called Biblical Worldview from A to Z, we're taking the 26 letters of the alphabet wanting to recapture and recover biblical definitions that will help your growth, whether you've been in the Lord and born again for two weeks or you've been born again for 20 years. It is beginning to deal with really just to recapture biblical definitions to help people to speak and to stand. And every one of those letters are so important. A from atonement, B for the Bible, C for the church, D for discipleship. And as I was praying and really Sensing, what does God want to say for O? Oh, and, and, and folks, I'm going to tell you, I, have, I knew what God was speaking to my heart. And I want to talk to you about O oh, being for obedience. And as we begin to deal with a very important point of obedience. E. Stanley Jones was a missionary to India and a Christian statesman in the 20th century. Really, um, some of his most effective work was done in the 40s and the 50s. And he tells of a time he was about to board a plane. And he says, I heard God speak to me and says, do not get on that airplane. And he later learned that that plane that he was supposed to get on crashed and there were no survivors. When he shared his experience with someone else, with another missionary there, I want want you to understand what E. Stanley Jones, without being disrespectful for those that perished in that, I want you to hear his heart. Don't miss the point. E. Stanley Jones, I'm going to show it to you, that the other missionary said, you mean to say that there were on, you were the only one God told not to get on that plane, to which E. Stanley Jones said, by no means, but it is possible I was the only one listening. And this is so important because I believe God is always speaking. And I don't I don't want to be one that just listens, but obeys when he speaks. Now, God speaks, make sure you understand this. God is always speaking through his word. He is speaking through his servants. He is speaking through providence. That will be things that may be happening that God begins to formulate and put together. His acts, he will will begin to speak through his Holy Spirit. And so many times, I know I have missed hearing God's voice because I've not been paying attention or I've been distracted. It's amazing to me that the word obedience that we're dealing with today comes from a Latin word which actually means to give great attentiveness to. It is the, to hear and to, uh, to, to focus on what is being said. But this is what's also interesting. The Latin word for deaf, not hearing, It means, the Latin word we get is the word absurd or absurdus, which means, which is so important, which says when we're no longer listening and obeying, it literally can be absurd for us and what the future is. See, when God is speaking, we know that there's really two options when God is speaking. You're faced with two choices. Here it is, obedience or disobedience. That's, that's really what's before us. That, that when you're not obedient, it is disobedience. And that's why when I think about a, a great woman of God that, is, that, that um, spoke for us 
even in Detroit, from Youth with a Mission, gone to be with the Lord just a few years ago, was a woman named Joy Dawson. And this is what she said. She says, when you choose disobedience, she said, disobeying him, God, is the same as telling him to hold back all of the blessings that come with obedience. And then she said, that's not only stupidity, that's insanity. That when you realize all that God wants to do from saying yes, the choir sang that first song and, I, and it just resonates with me when they started shouting out, yes, Lord, for the rest of my days. I want that to be my heart cry. See, when God's grace changes our status from rebel to the redeemed, I believe we are empowered to obey God through the Holy Spirit, empowered by his spirit to say yes. It's not what we do from willpower, it's what we do from God's power within us. And folks, let's just be honest. Obedient, obedience can be inconvenient. Sometimes obedience can be lonely. And even obedience can be difficult. But here's the good news. Obedience always gets the attention of God and gets the attention of heaven. God... Listen, whoever you may be, it may be simply being obedient to praying over your meal, saying grace over your meal while you're in a school cafeteria. You could be here as an athlete from high school to college to, to professional sports, and it may be God giving you a boldness to speak up in a locker room to, to fellow athletes on, on a strong conviction or a biblical issue. It may be if you're working in a company choosing not to lie about numbers that a supervisor is asking you to do, and it's an issue for you of integrity. I love what the writer A.W. Tozer said when he said, the true follower of Christ will not ask, if I embrace this truth, what will it cost me? Rather, he'll say, this is truth. God help me to walk in it, no matter what comes my way. And that's why this is so important. Folks, let me just tell you, as I was preparing this, I kept thinking to myself, this phrase kept hitting me, that the greatest gift I can give to my family, to my wife and four children, is obedience, an obedient life to God. It is the greatest blessing that any one of us can, mothers and fathers, is to listen to a God and obey. Because my obedience, your obedience, has generational effect. It lives beyond you. Listen to what Moses says in Deuteronomy 12, 28. Moses says these words. He says, be careful to listen to all these words which I command you so that it may be well with you and your sons after you forever. For you will be doing what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. When I obey God, it doesn't just go well with me. It goes well with my son and my three daughters it goes well far into the future. That's why, listen, obedience to God has long-lasting effect and disobedience has long-lasting effects. And that's why this is such a key part. Now, here's what I want to build it on for just a moment. Listen to an important question connected to obedience. Here it comes. How do I know if I love Jesus? This is such an important question as we begin to look at obedience. John 14, 15, this is what Jesus says. If any, this is, he says these words. If you love me, obey my commands. It's an obedience issue. Love and obedience are the two things that go together. But the danger is when we know his commands and somehow we want to find ourselves editing them to our liking, to our taste, and even to our culture. It's rewriting, revising, even modifying. Now, I want you to get this down because this is the best definition I can give you of obedience. Obedience is doing God's will, God's way, in God's timing. That's what obedience is. It's doing God's will, God's way and God's timing. Or to, to say it another way, obedience is doing what God says, when God says it, and how God says it. What God says, when God says it, and how God says it. Now, 1 Samuel 15 has one of the greatest verses 
on obedience and how God sees it greater than even worship. Now here it comes, don't miss this. The Bible does not say, if you love me, you'll worship me. It says, if you love me, you'll obey me. That's what it says. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey what I speak to you. And I would think that this moment today that you were lifting your hands and singing the songs, that that was the key of saying, that's how much we love you, God. And, and we are told by Jesus, the Son of God, that the very key to understanding whether we love God or not is us responding, not with religious things, not with even worship, not even offering worship, it's by doing what God asks us to do. That's the verse, and you'll recognize a couple of these, these phrases in here because it's a passage spoken to somebody, the first king of Israel that tried to rewrite, modify, and then cover, cover his disobedience with religious activity. Listen to these words, which is the response to somebody who didn't do it God's way. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel the prophet says, has the Lord God have a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He's saying this, do you think that God would rather have you worship or, or obey him? He says, you, you've missed the point. And then these famous words, to obey is better than sacrifice. You could put worship in there. You could put um, volunteering in there, giving in there, anything you want to put in there. And we are told that to obey is better than any sacrifice we can make and to heed than the fat of rams. He's talking about Old Testament sacrifices. And then these powerful words, which is on the other side of obedience, which is disobedience. And I want, to, want you to see how poignant this is. For rebellion is as the sin of of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. See, verse 22 says, God would rather have you obey than to do religious stuff with enormous passion. And verse 23 is the kind of the slap in the face to bring us to reality, to understand why this is so important. And he uses five words to describe disobedience. Five words. Listen to them. He says disobedience is like rebellion, witchcraft, stubbornness, iniquity, and idolatry. Folks, this is so dangerous that when we know what God is saying and not doing it God's way, when God says it, how God says it, and, and, what, and, and understanding what he's asking us to do. And 1 Samuel 15 is the story of the first king of Israel, how a king forfeited his future and anointing, don't miss this, through disobedience, yet kept his position as a king. Let me say those words again. First Samuel 15 is how King Saul's disobedience forfeited his future anointing, and yet... God kept him in his position. Don't miss this now. You need to get this. God is the only employer that will fire you and let you keep your job. That scares me because, and I'm going to tell you why, God helped me to keep me in a pulpit in a, with a disobedient heart. God help me to stand in front of a microphone and sing or play or sing in a choir or volunteer. And God goes, you can keep your job, but there won't be any anointing, no freshness and no touch from God. Folks, I'm just telling you, that frightens me. That to, and, and what he's saying was, you're trying to do religious stuff, religious stuff, and, and yet there's disobedience. Joy Dawson went on to say, listen to this, delayed obedience is disobedience, partial obedience is disobedience, doing what God asked with murmuring is disobedience. I'm going, God, I'm in trouble. <laughs> How many times I've, I've said, yes, Lord, with a murmur in my spirit. 
Delayed obedience is disobedience. That's Psalm 119, verse 60. David says, I hastened and did not delay to keep your commands. Obedience with murmuring is still disobedience. Listen to Deuteronomy 28, 45, and 47. So all these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you until you are destroyed because you would not obey the Lord your God by keeping his commands and his statutes, which he commanded you. Listen to this. They shall become a sign and a wonder on you and your descendants because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart. My goodness. And then finally, partial obedience. And that's the first Samuel 15 passage that I want to read to you today. I I, I sometimes forget that obedience is not only for my family and for their future. It's honoring God most of all. But literally, even some people's lives could even be at stake when you are not being obedient. Sunday morning is always a special time for me. And I'm going to tell you why. When I'm praying for you and praying that God would come speak to us at this one o'clock service. It's also the time that I'll have my phone with me because I'll start texting as God puts them on my heart. God will put certain pastors on my heart, not just around New York, but different parts of the country. And I'll text them and just say, God put you on my heart. I'm praying and I'm praying this for you right now that God would touch you. I don't text, you know, the same. I don't go through the same circle every single week. I just let the Holy Spirit speak to me. And Two weeks ago, I talked to a pastor who said, I have to tell you and say thank you for listening to the Holy Spirit. I said, what are you talking about? He said, two months ago, I got up on a Sunday morning getting ready to go to church. And he said this to me. I I heard it with my own ears. He said, I got up, my body has been failing me and I was just in a lot of pain. He said, I felt like my mind was under attack every part of my spiritual life. And he said, I was getting up knowing I had to go to church, had to lead, had to preach. And he said, I could not do it any longer. He said, I was done. And this is what he told me. He said, I said to the Lord, I'm finished. It was almost like an Elijah prayer. He said, take my life. He's praying this on Sunday morning before going to church. And I said, I understand that kind of prayer. You just go, I I just can't go on. I can't do this. And he says, I literally asked God, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. He said, take my life. And he said, when I said those words, my phone dinged. And there was this text from you that said, praying for you that God would give you strength to go on and that you would continue to preach today with a new anointing and a new strength. He looked at me and said with tears in his eyes, he just goes, thank you for being obedient to the Lord. Thank you for listening to the Lord because your obedience is why I'm even still here today. Think about this for a second, folks. I didn't feel that way. I mean, I I don't know if he, if, if how that it was just simply a text, but he knew, only, only God knew that there was going to be a simple text that maybe put some more gas in the, in the tank to say, I can do this with God's help. So let me tell you just for a moment, an obedience and disobedience story in the book of first Samuel. It's about the first King of Israel, Saul. God was clear when he asked him, he gave him the when, the how, and the what in first Samuel. And this is what God asked him to do. God spoke to Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites. Utterly destroy the Amalekites. Saul does, goes, and Saul edits God's command and brings home the best and the enemy king. I want to just pause for one second. I want to be obedient to the Lord for something. When I was telling you that story about that pastor, I added something to that. And God just convicted me now and says that he didn't actually say that. It wasn't true. And I'm just being obedient to the Lord. And he, he spoke to me and said, I wanted to die. And then I added to it um, that your text kept me alive. That wasn't true. Now, some of you are looking at me going, well, it was just an embellishment. I'm telling you, that's what obedience does. You could be in the middle of preaching. And seriously, I'm reading this and the Holy Spirit's going, tell them you lied. I'm going... I'm I'm trying to speak on obedience here. I'm trying to speak on obedience. I'm just telling you, I'm looking at the words on on my notes and all of it's getting fuzzy and all I 
see if this word lied. Tell them, and I'm going, I didn't even write that down. But this is, I, being obedient to the Holy Spirit means more to me than anything else, folks. It means more to anything else. And that's why I want to be so careful. Because here's, here's what I've learned, is when you embellish, exaggerate, and even telling a story, what you start doing is you start re relying upon your exaggeration and lies to carry you instead of the anointing of God. Folks, listen to me carefully. And if you're a leader out there, I want you to listen. God can only anoint truth. God can only anoint when you speak the truth. And so I'm, I'm grateful. Folks, let me just tell you, I'm embarrassed, but I'm grateful for the Holy Spirit. Okay. Well, here we go. God speaks to Saul and says, utterly destroy all the Amalekites. Saul does go, but Saul does edit God's command. And what he does is he brings home the king and the best, or what he thought was the best of what was there after his victory. And the chapter shows this confrontation. It starts off with Samuel going to anoint the king and eventually starts telling the new king, you've just lost being the, the, the king in the future. God has just stripped away your authority and has taken away your anointing. Think about this. He wins the battle, but loses the future. It's a defeat within a victory. That's why you could lose your future on self-edited obedience. So keep this in mind as we read this. Saul got rid of what Saul wanted to, not what God wanted him to get rid of. So let me read this to you. 1 Samuel 15, 1. Then Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. So the, the anointing to become the king is about to happen. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he has done to Israel, how he set himself against them on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek. Now watch all these, th these words that come. And utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, put to death man, women, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. And I want you to see what happens at the end. Verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag, the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But they destroyed everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Do you see the editing of the command? God says, I want everything gone. He comes in and edits it. Now, folks, I, I want to I say this to you. It is a lot easier to do what God tells us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the consequences of not doing it. I, I, I would rather be obedient, even though it's difficult, than to face the greater difficulty of disobedience and consequence. So it, it's, it's just doing what God asks Instead of, instead of trying to add all this religious part to it, I was thinking of the story of Mark Twain, the great American writer. He said this ruthless businessman came to Mark Twain who had a, a belief in God. And he said to Mark Twain, he said, before I die, this is this, this ruthless, cheating businessman. Before I die, I'm going to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. I'm going to climb up on Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments aloud at the top of the mountain. Mark Twain said, I have a better idea. Stay in Boston and just keep the Ten Commandments. That would be so much better. So instead of going through all this, these exercises, just do what God wants is what he was saying. Now the rest of the story that I'm going to read to you over these next few moments is what's frightening to me. It's the part that as I was praying for what to do today, it's the part that leaped off the page because of what happens is, is something that is evolving, not only then, but I think it's even happening now. And I want to talk to you and take the last few moments to talk to you about what I call the worshiping backslider. The worshiping backslider. And you're going to see this in a moment. First, so you have to keep this in mind. God says, I want, I want you to utterly destroy. Saul brings back the king and the best. And here's what happens. When Samuel shows up, to confront Saul, and this is what happens. Look at verse 13. Samuel came to Saul 
And before even Samuel could say anything, look at the religious talk. Blessed are you of the Lord. I've kept the command. He didn't even give him a chance. But he already, he was almost, it was almost like a diversion that before you can ask me, let me just give you a hallelujah and give you also, I've done what God wanted me to do. So let's go on to the next thing. And I listen to what Samuel says. He says, and what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen? Sin will always give you away. I'm telling you, if you're disobedient, it doesn't take long. It will come out. I'm just telling you. In fact, I heard, I, I, I didn't say this in the first service, but I remember someone saying to me, they said, before you even, when somebody is living in disobedience and in sin, before you know the sin of, of, what, of what they're living in, you'll always see it in the attitude first. That's the bleeding of the sheep. That's the, the lowing of the eye. You'll hear it in their tone. You'll hear it in their sarcasm. You'll hear it in the way that they talk. Like before you know what they're doing, it's there. There's a bleeding of the sheep and you're going, wait a second. There's something going on here that doesn't sound right. Saul said they have brought them, the, he answers Samuel and says, they brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed. And, and now he's trying to cover it over. He says, we, we spared that so we can offer them to Jesus. That's why we're doing this. Let me just say this before I read Samuel's response to this, this, this insanity, this insane response of Saul um, Tozer said it like this, it's altogether doubtful whether any man can be born again who comes to Christ only for his help with no intention to obey him. With no intention to obey him. We want his help. We want him to fix stuff, but we have no intention to obey him. Listen to what he says. Samuel says, the Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord sent you on a mission and said, go utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, Fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Now, folks, here it comes. Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. This is the deception. And went on a mission which the Lord sent me. And I brought back Agag. God never said that. The king of Amalek. And I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. It wasn't true. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the thing devoted to the destruction. Now he's blaming it on the people. He's the one in charge so they can sacrifice it to the Lord your God at Gilgal. And then the famous word, Samuel said, as the Lord is much delight in those burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of You're offering something that God said, I, I don't want this part of your offering. I don't want this in your religious services. I don't want this in your worship. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And then he says, that for the rebellion is as a sin of divination or witchcraft. Insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry because you've rejected, look at this, because you've rejected the word of the Lord, God has rejected you from being king. Now folks, I want you to get this. This must have frightened Saul because the next words out of his mouth Look at it in verse 24. Then Saul said to Samuel, when he heard these words, what are the next three words? I have sinned. Now folks, which makes me think he was lying earlier. Because he, it just, he realized his I, see, his I have sinned is connected to you can't be king anymore. That's how it was connected. It's like, it's like, the person that kind of gets into reality when he's messing up his marriage or messing up at his job, he doesn't, he doesn't snap out of it until he hears, I want a divorce or you're fired. Then all of a sudden, we become humble when we hear the consequences. So verse, it says this in verse, in verse uh, 24, I have sinned, I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, therefore, listen to what, how he says it now. He's going to kind of prescribe what he's supposed to do. Please pardon my sin and return with me. Here it comes, that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, 
I will not return with you. You've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore it. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. Also, the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. Then he said, here it comes again, I've sinned. And then, folks, this is where it just gets dark. This is what he says, I've sinned, but honor me before the elders and the people and before Israel. It's like, let, let this keep this between us. And go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. Let me just continue on with the stuff that I brought and do my worship thing. And sad words, Samuel went back from following Saul. What does Saul do? Worship the Lord. Pardon my sin, he says, but come with me that I may worship the Lord. Now, folks, this is the origin. I I, I truly believe this with my heart. This is the origin of a dangerous practice in, in the church and in Christianity today. This worshiping backside. Let me define this. Get this. This is so important. I felt this strongly by the Holy Spirit. The worshiping backslider is the Christian that can worship with an intensity while living in blatant disobedience. Let me say that again. The worshiping backslider can lift the hands with this intensity, with, 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 lift up their hands with a passion, worship the Lord, sing every worship song in a service, but will live in blatant disobedience. Folks, I'm telling you, it's happening. It's happening on stages and preachers and leaders and believers. And here is the false theology of it. Don't miss this. The false theology is that my worship is my repentance. That if I'm living in disobedience, I cover it by my worship of God. That you could be up here, whether singing or preaching, You could be watching today and and leading something, leading a ministry, leading a church, and think that I cover it by simply doing something passionately. Folks, the only thing that covers sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can cover our sin. Now pause for a moment here. What is backsliding? Let me just say this. Because backsliding is the easiest thing to do because you do nothing. That's how it starts. It's not, a, it's not a blowout. It's a slow leak. Think of it. Samson was asleep when he lost his strength. So it's Jerry Vines, one of the great Florida Baptist preachers from the 60s. I was reading what he said. He said, these words challenged me. He says, are you backslidden now? He says, I'm going to help you answer the question. A backslidden Christian is any Christian who is not as close to Jesus as he used to be. Then he says, was there ever a time in your life when you were more consecrated to the Lord than you are now? Was there ever a period in your life when you felt the presence of God more than you feel now? Was there ever a moment in your life when your love for Jesus Christ was more real than it is this very minute? And if so, you need a revival. I need a revival. We need a revival. Because here's the question. When you're sitting in a service... When you're taking communion, is there this heart inside of you to protect the fire and the freshness of the Holy Spirit? Let me tell you what I mean. When was the last time you were lifting your hands in worship or, or, or sitting, in an, uh, sitting watching, whether you're watching from home around the world, and felt God said, stop. You need to make this right before you continue on. Some of you may be looking at me going, Pastor Tim, that's a little much. But Jesus said, this will happen to his listening disciples. Listen to the, listen to the, to the, 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 um, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said this right after the Beatitudes. He says, therefore, if you're offering a gift at the altar and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, this is what he says, stop worshiping. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go be reconciled, then come back and get this right. But what he was basically telling us, the worst thing to do is to find yourself getting in the habit that you can worship through disobedience. 
to worship through. He says, this is a dangerous thing that can happen to any one of us. See, in today's language, it would read something like this, that while you're sitting here in a service and while you're singing, all my life you have been faithful, the Holy Spirit comes and says, wait a second, I'm faithful, but right now you're not. You're lifting up your hands, but you're sleeping with your girlfriend. You're lifting your hands, but you're speaking evil of this person. You're singing loud, but you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. Put your hands down. Let's get it right. Pick it up and then come back and let's worship with clean hands and a pure heart. <laughs> Folks, well, I mean, it, it, while, I was, while we were in communion, it was, it was just a, some time ago, we were in communion and before... I could even open up those silly cups and, and, and we do that for COVID and for protection. I get it. But as I was opening up, the Holy Spirit said to me, do not take communion until you go and apologize. You spoke sharply to a staff member. And so I was telling him, okay, keep singing. And sing until I can reconcile this. Because, it, because it's serious to me that before I want to honor the blood, I need to make sure that my heart was Right? I don't want to get into the habit of doing, of preaching when I know that something's not right between me and my wife. I want to make sure that I'm not here preaching and I'm knowing that there is sin in my life. I want to make sure that I don't get used to, uh, if the danger is leaning on a gift and a talent when inside the fire is being quenched. And this is where the Holy Spirit, now folks, listen, I get it. Some of you are going like, I to, looking at somebody just going like, this is why I didn't want to go to this church. This is why I didn't even want to come here today. It's 4th of July. We should be eating hot dogs. And here we are getting yelled at. Folks, let me just tell you. We're trying to save your future today. We're trying to save your life today. That you'd understand how important this is. That when you're hearing a message on forgiveness, that you're sitting there instead of going like, wow, that was a good word. Who can I send it to? Or is it, or is it you saying, God, what are you saying to me? Or you're hearing a message on integrity going like, yeah, I know a couple of people that, that are stealing. And God's going, what about you? <laughs> See, what are you hearing right? Because, I, because it's so amazing. We, we were singing a song today and I was just thinking of all these songs and that, that, we, were, that we have sung in the past. I'm, I'm saying thank God for the worship in this place and worship that happens. But, but it's amazing to me. I, of all the songs, we were singing something that talks about I have regrets, I have mistakes. I, I have never heard a, a, a modern worship song that puts the word disobedience in it. I know it doesn't rhyme with anything. But nobody says that. I, 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 it's disobedience. If I'm not obeying God, it's, it's not a shortcoming or a mistake. It's disobedience. And for me, in the spirit, I'm going to be a little spiritual now. In the spirit, you know what, Ryan? If you want something to rhyme with disobedience, here it is. Repentance. That's what. And you're going, like, it really doesn't rhyme. No, but it fixes the disobedience is what it does. Tell me the last song you heard that, I, that it's going like, I've been disobedient. No, we haven't even seen stuff like that anymore. Somebody, please write a song on disobedience and repentance. Saul wanted to worship but not be obedient. Saul wanted to worship but not be obedient. And the story ends, and as we get ready to close, the story ends with two unbelievable things. Saul has his hands lifted up in worship and, and Samuel has to kill Agag and carry out the obedience. While Saul is worshiping, Samuel is trying to fulfill obedience. Saul lifted his hands when he should have had a sword in his hand. It's a swordless hand. It's swordless hands are those that God has told you to cut off something, get rid of something, stop doing something and we keep holding on to stuff and we have swordless hands. God goes, I've asked you to get rid of that. I've asked you to cut off that number those, from texting this individual, that acquaintance, that hurt, that offense. But we simply, what we do is we hold on to it. We have swordless hands. We hold on to the same attitude, the same look, the same undisciplines. And here we are in such a dangerous place. So let me finish with this as we close, as the band comes. Listen. Because we learned something devastating about Saul's death. 
just before David is about to become king in 2 Samuel chapter 1. Something devastating. Because it's not the end of the story. The end of the story is really 20 years later. And the folks, lock into this for just a moment. This is, this is, a, uh, is, is almost like the story's end and mic drop moment. Remember, don't ever minimize what God asks you to do. Don't edit it. Rewrite it. Revise and modify. God has a reason for saying, stop doing that. Stop saying that. Stop using profanity and, and consider yourself, I'm a mature Christian. I can use it. Stop it. God has a reason for this. He sees future and further than you can ever see. Saul, utterly destroy all the Amalekites. Get rid of them. Well, I like to keep the best, the best of it. I like to keep the king. God goes, I need Amalek utterly destroyed. I'll edit. I'll revise. Here it comes. 20 years later, David is one chapter away from becoming king. And let me tell you, when he finds out about Saul's death, a young boy comes in to David's court and talks about the death of Saul. Because David, who's loved Saul and Jonathan, says, tell me, tell me, tell me, are they still alive? And here's what it says. So David said, this is 2 Samuel 1, so David said to the young man who came in, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? Look at this. The young man said to him, by chance I happened to be on Mount Geboa. And behold, Saul was leaning on his spear. And behold, the chariots and the horsemen pursued him. Now, folks, look at me. So Saul was coming to the end of his life. And this is how he dies. Verse 7. When he looked behind, he saw me and called. And I said, here I am. And he said to me, who are you? And I answered and said, I'm an Amalekite. I'm an Amalekite. Then he said, stand beside me and kill me for agony has seized me because my life still lingers inside of me. Verse 10, so I stood beside him and I killed him. Folks, Saul is killed by the thing he was supposed to kill. He was killed. God said, I want, I got this God. I know better for me. I don't need that. God saw 20 years into the future and said, the thing you kept alive, the thing Saul was killed by what he called, in, in quotes, one of the best. I'm going to keep one of the best. It's best, look at me, it's best for me. This is best, this relationship, the way me, me declaring identity or all this stuff, and we haven't even gotten to this yet. This is best for me. Oh, so what God says is not best. You decided based on your taste, likings, and culture what's best. Folks, I'm just telling you, I got to go with what God said. And what God is speaking to us. And here's where we close. You have to decide obedience before even God says anything. Decide obedience before God gives even the command. We get it backwards. We think it like, goes like this. We think God speaks, I, I'll listen, and then I'll decide. That's not the way it works. I already decided I'm going to obey. It doesn't matter what you ask. It, it, it goes, the, the, the only command that the Virgin Mother Mary ever gave was this at a wedding. She says, whatever he says to you, do it. That's the way I live. Whatever he says. I had a youth pastor from Alabama teach me a prayer. And folks, I can't tell you how many times I've whispered this prayer. This, it, it just came out of nowhere. He said, in that southern accent, he said, Pastor Tim, this is a prayer. I said, and I said, thank you. He gave, gave this to me almost 15 years ago. And here it is. You ready for this? Get, get your cameras out. Get your phones out. I said cameras. You don't carry cameras. You carry phones. Here it comes. I'm going to teach you a prayer. It goes like this. God, the answer is yes, even before you ask. 
The answer is yes, even before you ask. Come on, whisper that to him right now. God, the answer is yes, even before you ask, even before you ask. Peter Marshall was considered to be one of the great chaplains of the United States Senate. He was pastor of the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C. His, his prayer life and his witnessing literally brought stirrings of the Holy Spirit to Congress when he was there. And I was reading his biography and he says he was trying to avoid ministry and go into the Navy. He heard God calling, but literally disobedient, just disobedient. He said, knowing God called him to ministry, he was going to the recruiter's office for the Navy. He said he failed the test, so despondent. And on a rainy, foggy day, he was walking home from the recruiter's office. And Peter Marshall tells the story as he's walking through the woods, taking a shortcut back to his house or to where his parents lived that he's never been before. He's walking through it, could barely see ahead of him. He said he heard a voice, his name was called. And this is what he heard. He said, when he heard his name, he said, I heard Peter. And he stopped and I said, who is that? Then he just kept walking, heard it again, Peter. And he goes, who's calling me? And finally, the third time he heard his name and he knew it was God calling him. And Peter Marshall said this, he said, I stopped and knelt on that third call and said, yes, Lord. I'll do whatever you want me to do. I won't go in the Navy, whatever you want me. And God called him to the ministry. You're going to pastor and you're going to bring revival to Congress. You're going to bring a, a work of God. And Peter Marshall wrote, he said, when he tried to get up, he pushed his hand down and nothing was there. He said he pushed his, he realized this. When he knelt and was pushing to get up, he knelt at the foot of a precipice of a rock quarry that he said, if I would have taken one more step, I would have plummeted to my death if I didn't listen to God. He said, when I knelt right here and when I pushed to get up, there was nothing. And I knew when I said yes to God, he just rescued my future. He just rescued my future. Stand with me. Stand with me. Here's the challenge. I feel so strongly about this, folks, so strongly, that before we take any other step right now, before we do anything, balcony, main floor, I want you to listen, those that are watching online, this is a moment that God is saying, before we offer any worship, God is speaking to your heart right now and saying, I've gotta get this right with God. There's an area, I've been swordless, and God is asking, don't, don't take another step without saying, yes, Lord. God, I want you to deal with this area. How many sense right now that God is speaking to them about an area of your life going, deal with that, deal with that, deal with it. Hold it up high. Hold your hands up high if that's you. Here's what I'm going to ask you. Balcony, main floor. As we sing this song, if God is speaking to you right now, I want you to get out of your seat and walk up here. We're going to say, God, this is going to be an altar of going. We trust you. We're giving this over. Come on. As we sing this, oh, come to the altar, balcony, main floor. Would you begin to make your way up here as we begin just to sing this together and believe for the Lord to do it? Come on, let's sing this, and then we're going to come back and pray. The altar, the Father's arms are
Tim asked me if I would come close out the meeting today. I want you to know I'm at this altar too with you, those of you who responded. As I was just worshiping, even in the morning service, I felt the Lord tell me, I want you to delete this app and this app. It's a distraction. That's what I felt the Lord telling me. So I'm with you at the altar today as we respond to him. Would you lift your hands as a sign of surrender to him today? And we're going to begin to pray and we're going to begin to surrender to the Lord, whatever he's asking us to surrender today. Father, we thank you for this word. What a powerful call. What a clarion call, Lord. What a clear call. Lord Jesus, we come to you to surrender. Lord, we've heard your word, which is still a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, we're asking that you would come in and take complete control. God, that you would take complete control. We surrender. We yield to you, Lord. We yield to you, Jesus. We yield to you today. Thank you, God, for whom the Son says free is free indeed. Lord, we ask that you would come fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit and that you would break every chain that is bound, Lord. Lord, we ask that your word that we heard today would renew our minds, oh God. You said, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so let your word renew our minds today and in the days ahead. Give us a hunger for your word, a thirst for your presence. Lord, that we would long for more of you than anything else, Lord. God, we yield to you today. We surrender to you today. Come on, begin to talk to your God. Begin to talk to him. You talk to him. Online, you talk to him. You tell him what you need to tell him today. You begin to surrender. Yield to him. That which he's asking you to be obedient in. Yield to him today. Yield to him today. Hallelujah. God, we yield to you today. Whatever you want, God, you've got it. Whatever you want, we say yes, Lord. Yes to your will and to your way, oh God. Oh, what a Savior, God, that you would not let us go continually in darkness and to destruction, but that you would send your word to heal us. You would send your word to deliver us. You would send your word to cleanse us. You would send your word to change us. You would send your word, oh God. Lord, to lift us out of darkness into your marvelous light. To lift us out of rebellion into obedience. Lord, to lift, up, lift, lift us out of stubbornness and witchcraft. Oh God, to worship to the one true and living God. God, we thank you for freedom. We thank you for deliverance today. We thank you for the ability now to be able to see a way forward, oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, to be able to see what our next steps are, oh God. Because we've taken step one, oh God, what you've been asking us to do all along, oh God. God, we thank you, Lord. God, we thank you, Jesus. And God, we bless you for this word today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to your name. Somebody say, glory to your name, oh God. Glory to your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for not letting us go, oh God, but coming and delivering us and rescuing us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for fresh vision, fresh passion. God, direction, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for an open heaven, Lord. Thank you for an open heaven, oh God. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Folks, before we close out this meeting, I want to give an opportunity for those who would like a fresh start. Maybe you were backslidden and you drifted away from the house of God and you hadn't worshiped the Lord in a long time, but you came today. Or maybe you've never been in a church like this before but you sense God calling you. You sense him. That's what drew you to him. And if you say, pastor, that's me. I want a fresh start. I want a fresh start. Jesus called it being born again. As a matter of fact, he said, you must be born again. And so what God says is a must. We cannot make optional. As Pastor Tim said, we can't excuse it. We can't edit it. We have to do what God says. What does that mean? 
the Bible says, well, he came to his own in the Gospel of John, and even they rejected him. But to all who believe him and accept him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are born not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. See, we all experienced a physical birth, but what God is talking about is a spiritual birth, a supernatural birth that only God can produce in your life and mine. And it starts, it's, it's as simple as ABC. A stands for admit. You and I admitting that we are sinners and that we accept the sacrifice of Jesus for us. We admit that we need him and that we can't do this without him and that we want him. B stands for believe. Believe that Jesus died for your sin and mine to take away the sins of the world and that was enough. And then C stands for confessing him as Lord. In other words, Jesus, you are the boss of my life now. I'm asking you to navigate my life. I want your destiny. I want your plans. You created me for more than this. And I've made a mess of things. Now I'm surrendering the steering wheel of my life to you and I'm asking you to get in the driver's seat, Jesus, of my life, my family, my career, my dreams, my marriage, my relationships, everything that I am, my destiny. God, I'm asking you to take the wheel and take control and begin to order my steps into the destiny that you created me for from the very beginning. Amen? If that's you and you say, Pastor, I want to be born again. I want a fresh start. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand with me right now all over this place. Raise your hand real high. It's okay, unashamedly. You're among family. You're among friends. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I see hands in the back here. I see some hands back here. Anyone in here? Anyone in the balcony who would like to pray? We're going to pray in a moment. Would you bow your heads? And would you pray this prayer with me? And we're all going to pray together for the sake of those who are coming to Christ. Pray from your gut today. Pray this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt. And you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Now I declare with confidence that God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper and heaven is now my home in jesus name amen and amen hallelujah <laughs>